briefly introduce everybody. They are going to be speaking briefly, each of them, describing what their institution is up to, and then we're going to have an open panel discussion hosted by me focus. So we have uh, at this end Scott Byron, who some of you may know, linked to uh, our, uh, a recent publication in our publication series, so you can see some of his really interesting work there. We have uh, Matt Russell, Matthew Russell, along with Rebecca Allen, who's coming from the Environmental Science Association. Or, yay, I can't know. <laughs> okay, I guess here she is. We did say the chair. Know, I, 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 there the um, then we have Far Western with AB Winter, Far Western nearby, a little bit farther east. Um, and then uh, Rincon, Rincon, Rincon Consultants with Kyle and we'll find out where they all work. And then William Self, who is not William Self, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, over here, I'm going to stand over here so I'm not in your account. And then Pacific Legacy is the nephew of John Holson. And then the last one we have here is A C A S C, uh, which is doesn't make sense because it's from Sonoma State. It is the Anthropological <laughs> Study Center. Acronyms are difficult. You know, Anthropological Study Center from Sonoma State, which is north here. So we're uh, in a sort of catchment area around the uh, Berkeley uh, region. So. Without further ado, uh, we don't care what the sequence is. We thought we'd start from one end and go to the other, but if that is not what you want to do, you can do whatever you want. But we would like you to be fairly brief. Thank you very much, and welcome. Um, that means we have to make a decision. Yes. Thank you so much. And then we can all say, I agree with AJ. <laughs> yeah, well, well, you can say, what the hell did he just say? <laughs> What's that? All right. See, now, now we'll see who's got eyes in the back of their heads. And we'll also see if this little machine actually works. There it is. Oh, F5. I remember that much from using a PC. All right, so uh, thanks very much for uh, inviting uh, Dana over here and me here. Um, so what's, what I'm gonna, what's gonna happen is I'll, I'll say things for a couple of minutes, then she'll say things for a couple of minutes. Um, so I'd start off by saying we're really kind of here under false pretenses uh, because ASC, uh, the Anthropological Study Center, is not actually a firm. It's not a CRM firm or a business because if it was, I'd probably be rich because I could sell it out and everything. It's really a, yeah, like John is. <laughs> uh, we're actually a, a university-based research institute, um, and the, our goal is really to give students the opportunity to do what it is that professional archaeologists do and to get paid for it. Um, we are um, located at Sonoma State University. It's about a campus of about 100,000 students, about 50 miles from here. Um, since uh, 1979, we've been offering an MA degree, and I've got flyers, <laughs> in cultural resource management. We've graduated uh, about um, 140 students, would you believe it or not, in that. Oh, next. I've so forgotten how to do this. Um, and I'll note that we, um, our, our degree is in CRM, and it's not in archaeology. Um, now, um, our mission is indeed to get people experience, but because you know most people don't actually design their careers to go into CRM. Uh, I actually did. Most uh, students uh, actually have this fantasy about being a professor. So I thought I'd tell you the reality of that. Um, some numbers here. There's about 1,100 tenured professors of anthropology in the U.S. Uh, each year about 160 new PhDs in North America. <coughs> so you do the math. So if you do the math, and I did this, that's okay, you need enough one. If they all turned over and everybody got a job who's got the degree, it would take about six and a half years. It doesn't happen. So the deal is most people are, who go into anthropology, uh, into archaeology rather, will either get a job in the cultural resource management field or they, pro or they might not get a job at all. Um, and in fact, when it comes down to it, CRM is actually a much better career choice for various reasons that I can give you. 
than uh, academia, as one who knows. Um, so, um, what do we do? Um, like, I, like I said, our mission is to give people practical experience, and we do it by uh, contracting um, to do required CRM studies, things that are done by law. People don't do these studies because they want to, by and large they don't want to do them, uh, but we take them up and we uh, do these studies on contract. Essentially we team uh, students, mostly gra graduate students, with professional staff and they get to work on the entire project with a bit of luck, all the way from constructing a scope of work all the way down to hopefully they don't do with billing. Ugh, well, you don't want to worry about that. Um, uh, deal with um, um, Native Americans and other uh, descendant groups. Uh, and the key thing is, um, because this is, a, this is not a simulated work environment, it's a real work environment, uh, students get paid at their level to uh, do this job. Um, uh, we do a whole bunch of different kinds of stuff, and you can read that. And this, is, this picture is actually on top of Fort Point. You know, the Fort, the Fort Point? I don't know if anybody's ever done archaeology 30 feet up in the air, but we're actually doing dirt archaeology 30 feet up in the air. I'll explain it later, but not now. Anyway, so we do all manner of, uh, of different things. Um, that relate to archaeology. We also do, um, uh, we're very big on working with tribes. Uh, Dana's going to talk about oral history and so on. Um, our goal is to help people walk straight out of our program and get a job, essentially, because they know how to do what it is that people in industry and people in government service actually do. You know, it's no good wa waving a piece of paper at someone and saying, oh, look, MA, MA, MA. They're going to go, oh, uh, yeah, but can you do anything? And the answer is often as not no. So our goal is to help them actually do stuff. Let's see what we got here. Oh, so I'm done with my talk, which means we're halfway done. So here's Dana. It will make a lot more sense than me. No. Um, so my name's Dana, and I'm the oral historian over at the ASC. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the other stuff, some of our other stuff. So we do a lot of oral history, um, a lot of it as part of the CRM projects, actually. Um, but we also do them as grant funded projects. I did one a few years ago that focused on um, Japanese flower growers in the East Bay and that was a, a Cal Humanities grant. I also just finished a national endowment for the Humanities grant um, that involved oral histories as well. So sort of branch out in that way and are able to do things with grants and oral histories. Um, and we also do it as an independent service. Um, did one for a, a private ranch actually where we rediscovered an old cemetery. So that was a really rewarding one. Um, and I will say that um, recently, a lot more of the um, theses that are coming through the program have involved oral histories. And a lot more people, a lot more students are coming to me and asking me, how do I incorporate this into my research? So that's a big change that I think we're seeing. Um, and then we also do interpretation, um, also as components of CRM projects. Um, and also as public outreach, parts of grants, like I said before. Um, and we also do interpretive planning. I'm now a certified interpretive planner. So extra letters behind my name now. Yeah, it's very exciting. Did you get a um, raise? No. No raise? Yeah. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> um, but so Here's we do. My <laughs> so we do planning documents. Like the example up there is one that was done for a state park. Um, and then, oh, did our other one not get in there? I didn't get in. Oh, okay. Well, there's supposed to be also sort of a, a technological slide in there. Not my area of expertise, but we do have that at our facility, we um, offer advanced GIS. Um, our new director, because sadly Adrian is our retiring director, but our new director is very focused on technology and, and archeology span in the digital age, um, and he has drones, which is very <laughs> exciting to us. So there's uh, 3D modeling and um, visualization. Visualization Outside. model, yes, so, so we, we offer that as well. We do stuff. We do, we do high tech stuff moving into the future. So right. I think that's it for us. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Next year, who's it going to be? Okay, I'm technologically 
All right, so how do I get out of here? Hey, all right. So now, I go up there. <laughs> I take my job very seriously. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, my name is John Holson. I'm one of the three, four owners of Pacific Legacy Incorporated. And I kind of took a little bit of tack, a different tack than this one. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our company and then talk about what's happening in CRM and then wind up with uh, giving you guys some pointers on how to get a job. So who we are, we have there's four principles. We work mainly California, Oregon, Hawaii, and uh, in the Pacific, like Guam and out there. We have a Hawaii office, which uh, everybody wants to go to, but only a few are chosen. Uh, we have eight senior archeologists, and when I walked in and thought it was all guys, I thought, oh man, this is like the Last Supper. But <laughs> six of our senior archeologists are all women, so. Uh, just to throw that in to be politically whatever. Uh, and then, so we have a whole administrative support staff. And when, one thing we do is we hire a lot of seasonal employees for our projects. And we do actually draw from Berkeley uh, quite a bit. I always felt that we were kind of a holding tank for PhDs that couldn't get jobs. Like Adrian said, they stay with us for a couple years and then uh, move on a bit. So what is CRM? Well, <clears throat> it's kind of managing uh, historical places of archaeological, architectural, historical, spiritual interest in considering such places in compliance with environmental and historic preservation laws. So the key thing is a lot of it's on, it's a legislated and that it happens. I've had the opportunity to work overseas um, in Tahiti and a lot of it is all legislated. As Adrian said, people don't, uh, some people don't want to do it. But Cultural resources, why should I care? Well, it's a collective cultural heritage. Uh, not that I'm promoting nationalism, like some people are these days, <laughs> but it does contribute to our sense of place and our cultural identity. Whether you're an ethnic community or an 1880s uh, building out at uh, Golden Gate National Recreation Area that has the history and stuff. Um, they do possess scientific, educational, uh, recreational, aesthetic, and spiritual values. So a lot of parks that you go to, uh, you know, there are archaeological sites, Malakoff Diggings, um, Rick Fitzgerald back there manages quite a few archaeological sites and, you know, the folks come and visit and have a good time. Uh, there's a lot of schools that visit and stuff. So, I mean, there's a whole component that you don't hear about uh, that's involved in that. Um, and they're finite, they're fragile, irreplaceable, and non-renewable. So when they built Bolt Hall, one of the earliest fraternities here on Berkeley campus, got excavated out there. So I'm not gonna go through all the laws, but these are all the laws, and uh, <clears throat> you can call my, uh, my office and ask for the laws, but you probably won't get an answer, <laughs> but you can look them up. Uh, and so one of the interesting places where we work is actually the Presidio San Francisco, and we like working out there. We have a, an on-call contract with them, <clears throat> um, and they have a really rich history that covers most of California, well, all of California's history, really. So um, one of the neatest projects, it's funny that you said Fort Point, Adrian, and I hope you guys do high air archaeology. One of the neatest projects we did was at the uh, barracks for the, the new Disney Museum. And then what I call the cubby holes are in the rafters when they were putting a new roof on, uh, there was all these things that soldiers had stashed over the years. So there was, uh, <laughs> well, there was condoms, there was cigarettes, <laughs> whiskey bottles, uh, uniforms, there was a set of love letters from an Italian prisoner of war back home. So archaeology just wasn't in the ground. It's, as Adrian said, it's in the air. And it was great. We found this one letter. If I start running on, because I tell stories. Now. But anyway, there's this, we found this one letter. It was from a, a guy. He had a, a liaison, shall we say, and thought he had a social disease. And we found actually who it was, and we could have looked it up and blackmailed his, uh, <laughs> his relatives. But we didn't. But it's an interesting slice of life. So the other thing to remember too is there's a lot of state laws. And I think that's gonna be important coming up with the new administration is how strong California, and since I work in Hawaii as well, uh, the Hawaii statutes are gonna be upheld. 
So why don't we add to the mix a little bit all the different agencies that get involved in historic preservation. So the CPUC is a California Public Utilities Commission, uh, California Energy Commission, State Parks, uh, Bureau of Land Management, Reclamation, blah, 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 blah. But the gist is they, have, they all have their own sets of rules for doing everything. And they're not consistent sometimes. And it drives you crazy when you're going, you have to figure out, okay, what's, what's the nexus? What's the regulatory nexus for this project? So basically, this is Kellyanne Conway. Uh, it's a three-step process. So we have identification, we have evaluation, and treatment. And that's basically it in a nutshell. So what direction are we going in? Are we getting moments of clarity? Or how do we have to take things to kind of ease ourselves through this, the coming four years? So I went through, and this is the first 40 days so far. Now, you've all heard about the executive orders and the 12 memorandums. So I went through them. So an executive order is something that the president has the authority to issue and kind of bypass Congress. But he still has to get the funding for it. A memorandum is just a direction. So I kind of called what he's done that may affect CRM in the last, uh, I think it's 41 days now, but anyway. So it's directing uh, a review of water rules that gives the federal government broad <coughs> regulatory authority <coughs> over rivers, streams, and wetlands. So part of the projects we do are with the Clean Water Act. It's called a Section 404 permit. You have to do kind of historical studies for it. So that may change. We'll just have to see. There's a regulatory reform task force uh, that evaluates regulations and recommends the rules for repeal or modification. Well, Trump is not the only one that's tried to reg, you know, do away with the regs. Uh, Bush tried to do with it, Clinton to some extent. With Bush, it was great because they were going to do away with the, the agencies that did the review, and then it dawned on them that, uh, uh, wait a minute, how am I going to get my project permitted? There's no one looking at my reports. But okay, so they figured that out before it actually made the, the thing. Uh, the one that I like is, and I'm going to embarrass my daughter, I tell her for every two pair of shoes she gets rid of, I'll give her one. Well, Trump adopted my plan for getting rid of stuff by saying for every regu one regulation that's new, we have to get rid of two. Lately, the Dakota Pipeline and the Keystone Pipeline have been. Uh, with the Dakota Pipeline, I actually went through and looked at it. They did produce an environmental document. And there was an archaeologist that, that worked, and it was mainly for federal land, so. Uh, and the document was actually OK. Uh, and so they, they couldn't fault the document. But what, what I didn't see was where they looked at what we call traditional cultural properties. And I think that was the point that, uh, uh, that would happen. Um, <clears throat> there probably could be, maybe will be, a possible reduction of uh, funding. Um, to make up for defense spending, uh, we're proposing $53 billion for defense spending. Um, and then the last thing that was hot off the press this morning, uh, we do a lot of what's called cir circular work, and that's kind of environmental cleanup, super fun. So old mines from the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s. Um, we just finished one and I brought a brochure about it, Sulphur Bank. Um, there's all kinds of arsenic, lead, and all that that pours into Sulphur Creek, which flows into oh, the hot springs. But it, the people there go there to commune and, and work with crystals, and, but they don't know that they're taking baths in arsenic lace water. But maybe it helps, I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, so I think that's <coughs> one area where there's gonna be uh, budget cuts. Uh, the thing that happened yesterday, this is our new Secretary of the Interior. So a lot of the laws for preservation are grouped under the, sec uh, the Department of the Interior. So we have the Secretary's uh, uh, standards and guidance for happy archaeologists or historians or whatever. So a lot of those rules come out of the Department of the Interior. Zinke says he's, he's going to support the parks. Uh, he's, uh, he may, there's proposals to turn uh, national parks over to the states. Uh, he says he's probably not going to let them uh, you know, sell off public lands, but the issue of oil, gas, and energy thing is going to be a big issue, and what kind of studies are going to be uh, required. So what's the solution? 
Well, at this point, it's kind of a wait and see. It's only been 40 days. People are freaking out. You should check out the ACRA website. They have a really good explanation of what's going on. But I want to emphasize that the public outreach component is very important. Uh, and I'm not, if there was a historic equivalent of a, a kitty hat or pussy hat, or whatever it was, uh, I would probably wear one. But anyway, you getting involved is, it actually does a lot. And I use the example up here of this hanger up here. This is hangar one at Moffett Field, which you've probably already seen. It was, environmentally, it was a disaster. I mean, there was PCBs, all kinds of nasty stuff that were dripping on the floor. But I think it was built in the 30s, and the Hindenburg, Hildenburg? Anyway, this is where the big uh, airships came in and stayed at Moffett. Well, in the 60s, they wanted to tear it down. 70s, they proposed to tear it down. But the community organized. It was not eligible for the National Register, but the community organized and said, we love it. So even though there was proposals to tear it down, Apple stepped in and joined with the community to help save it. So now it stores Apple's people's cars. I don't know, but uh, anyway, it got saved. And here we have uh, you know, different students coming out to help us work. Uh, this is classes from Cloverdale. Uh, this is a bride right here. You can see the money that we're getting. So we do take bribes to help out. So what's next? Who knows? <laughs> so anyway, well, you can go a couple ways on this one. Uh, but anyway, ACRA, the Society for California Archaeology, and the Society for American Ar Archaeology follow legislative actions. So you can always check there if you're interested. The goal seems to be reduced overall cost, time, and management. We need to better define what sites should be preserved. Uh, I think natural oil, gas and oil and energy seem to be the focus of doing away with some of the regulations. And actually, the infrastructure projects uh, may uh, produce more jobs. So how do I get a job? First shot, take the opportunity to talk with all these people here and uh, see what they say. They're all very knowledgeable. And the CRIS, the California Information, uh, California Historic Resources Information System, puts out lists of archaeologists. And I would recommend that you guys get that and then send out your resume to people on that list if they have their interests. Make sure your resume has field experience in, in it within the first five lines. I, I appreciate that people work at Starbucks and I worked at a liquor store, <laughs> you know, and all that. But you don't want to put that first. You want to show uh, what, what you're doing. <coughs> Do not send your resume on a brown paper bag or with coffee or grease stains. I had one creative person who heard about a job, wrote it on his lunch bag and sent it to me. <laughs> okay, all right, sure. And also hygiene is very important. Uh, so the other thing is get experience. You can't it, 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 I can't emphasize that so much. Field school, field school, field school. Take, well, you're an undergraduate, get that field experience. Volunteer if you can. Your professors can use some help. Uh, Jung, we hired one of Jung's students. Uh, well, we've hired Chris. We've had, actually hired a lot of people from here. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's always nice when they come in with a specialty like fauna analysis or geomorph or botanical or something like that. So just go to your professors and say, hey, I want some help. They like the free labor. Learn to write, okay? <laughs> and, okay, I misspelled it, you guys don't know. <laughs> but where the jobs are after the field work is over is at a desk writing up reports and stuff like that. The field work ratio, you have 20 people out in the field for 10 days, but you've got two people sitting in an office for three months writing up the report. So, uh, and then my last thing is, it's a wide world out there, and explore what you're interested in. The cool thing about archaeology um, is all of us all have different specialties, and you can generally find uh, one for you. That's it. Thanks, John. It's a tough act to follow. I spent three weeks on that.
No, that's not right. Um, anyway, sorry, that's not supposed to be there. <laughs> My name's Jim Allen, and, uh, I'm the president of WSA. Uh, we are a CRM firm, of course. Um, we do um, prehistoric, historic archaeology, we do maritime archaeology, we do historic architecture. We have offices um, in Arinda, which is where our corporate headquarters is. We have offices in Arizona, in Tucson, in Salt Lake City, Utah, in Cedar City, Utah, and in Austin, Texas. And from those, we do work all over the southwest and somewhat in the central part of the country. These are some of the projects we've done over the last few years. It's a little bit out of date, but it uh, gives you some idea of the breadth of our coverage. We have um, <clears throat> 26 uh, archaeologists on staff. Uh, eight of whom are PhDs, and I'm proud to say four of those PhDs came from Berkeley, including myself. We used to have five when Matt worked for us. <laughs> um, <laughs> I lost my program. <laughs> still, still not over it, huh? I, <laughs> I haven't forgiven <laughs> Um so I wasn't quite sure what it is you wanted to hear from us, and John certainly covered the gamut of everything I think you wanted to know, but not knowing that, I just thought I'd throw some slides in about some of the more interesting projects that we've done. These are mostly in, in the Bay Area in San Francisco. Um, <clears throat> just to give you an idea of some of the stuff that we do and what CRM firms in general do. Excuse my voice, I'm a little hoarse today. <clears throat> We're doing all the archaeology on the Trans Bay Transit Center project in downtown San Francisco. You may know of that. This is a project we started in 2003. And uh, if they build a high-speed rail part of it, we're not even half done yet. So this is a, a career project right here. And we're very pleased to ha have won it and have been able to do quite a bit of good archaeology on it. Um, this is some of the work that we did right in the beginning, uh, running into some Gold Rush era uh, house floors and deposits uh, related to the very early years of the Gold Rush. Um, all the way up through the 1920s and 30s. And interestingly enough, when we got to the very end of the ground disturbing part of the first phase of the project, which is the one that's gonna be finished before the high-speed rail, uh, they were within 25 or 30 feet of getting to the end of this big cement box that they built, putting in a cement floor. We found a burial 60 feet below, below ground that uh, dated to somewhere around 8,500 years ago. So that find in the middle of downtown San Francisco has sort of affected the way archaeology is being done in San Francisco from that point forward in terms of the city identifying that particular layer uh, below ground as being archaeologically sensitive when in the past it was never considered to be such. So now all the archaeological testing that goes on has to take into consideration the fact that there might be resources that are as deep as 60 or 70 feet below ground, cultural resources I mean. Uh, we're also doing a project over at the site of the former Schlage Lock Factory, which is down on Bayshore. If you go to the Cow Palace, and you, maybe you guys don't remember it because it's been gone for a while, but as you went down Bayshore, the Schlage Lock Factory used to be right there. It was built on top of um, the Ralston Shell Mound, which was a prehistoric shell mound that covered about two and a half acres. Um, William Ralston, who founded the Bank of California back in the 1860s or 70s, uh, built a, um, a soap factory on it. He sort of lopped the top of it off and built this big soap factory in uh, 1872. And that lasted until 1880 and that went out of business and that space sort of stayed idle until the Schlaglock factory bought it in 1925 and they completely graded the site so the shell mound is gone. Um, and of course in the nature of their work they created quite a bit of pollution so the site is being developed now for low income housing but the work that we've been doing on there for the last six or seven years uh, deals with the remediation of that pollution and the archaeology that's associated with it because, of course, the basal deposit of the shell mound is still there. And the burials that were put in the ground in the very earliest part of the formation of that shell mound are still there. So we're recovering burials out of that in this very highly <coughs> contaminated soil. So it's an interesting project, uh, but one that's sort of difficult because of that aspect of it. <clears throat> Another project we did in downtown San Francisco, the 300 Spear. This is a site of a shipbreaking yard that uh, started just after the beginning of the gold rush. Uh, a man by the name of Charles Hare came here from Baltimore and started breaking up the ships that had been abandoned during the gold rush and were clogging up near Buena Cove. So he would buy them and float them over to 
his shipyard, which was right at the foot of where the Bay Bridge touches down today in San Francisco. And uh, we knew it was there. Uh, some of our uh, other CRM firms had done work in the area in the past, so we knew that we were going to find some evidence of a shipyard, and sure enough, we did, which is what you see up here on the left corner. Those are all beautifully shaped ship pieces that were left behind by Charles Hare. Apparently, he just walked away one day and left these all behind. Um, he left, walked away, not willingly, I think, but they were filling in the cove, and I think they got to the point where his shipyard was, and it was time for him to go. So he left all this behind, and we were ecstatic. I, I'm a maritime archaeologist, by the way, so this is heaven for me. And we had a, a wonderful time there with all this stuff and um, thought we were done. And then several weeks later, this showed up. This is the last ship that Charles Hare was taking apart. It's a ship that we were later able to determine is called the Candace. It came to San Francisco in 1850 and was condemned because it was leaking. It was a whaler on its way home from uh, whaling up in, the Ar uh, Pacific, up in the Arctic on its way back to the East Coast. And it stopped in San Francisco because it was leaking so badly. It got condemned and Charles Hare bought it and floated it over to his yard and started taking it apart, and that's as far as he got. This underneath there is all the engineering superstructure that the project developer put up there so the ship wouldn't collapse. And we documented it, and um, it's significant because it's not the only ship that's ever been encountered in San Francisco, well, I'm sure we run into them <coughs> occasionally, but I wouldn't say frequently, but all of the ones that were found prior to this were either destroyed or left in place and buried forever on top, un underneath some building. This is the first one that's ever been recovered. And it was lifted out of the ground and put into a um, warehouse just south of where the Giants ballpark is. It's still there. And the plans for it are to, um, eventually it's gonna wind up in a park that's being developed at the site of Pier 70, which is where the Union Iron Works used to be. Uh, this is gonna be a nice plaza out there and they're gonna bring, this, bring the Candace out and put her there for um, public display. It has a lot of stories about the whaling and shipbuilding and the Chinese workforce that worked for Charles Hare. That there are so many stories. This particular artifact can tell. It's gonna be quite a nice display when they finally get it set up. So we thought we were done with 300 Spear. Across the street, the same developer bought a parcel. It's called 201 Folsom. Uh, we thought we'd run into some more evidence of Charles Hare Yard, and we did. More ship parts here and there. And then we found this thing right here. This is a, a vessel called a lighter. It was used in San Francisco for a very short period of time. This is rare. I don't think we've ever, ever recovered one of these. We only have evidence of them through pictures. This is the first one we've ever found. These were the <clears throat> little vessels that were used to move cargo from San Francisco out to the ships and from the ships back in before the wharves and the piers were built. Uh, Uruguayan Cove was very shallow and the ships couldn't get too close to San Francisco, so they were anchored up out in the cove. And this is the type of vessel that was used to ferry things back and forth, called a lighter. And uh, we have it perfectly intact. It looked like it was brand new when we found it. And uh, the National Park Service has taken it, and they're restoring it in their conservation facility in San Leandro, and it will eventually wind up in the National, Muse National Maritime Museum in San Francisco. This particular project is interesting not only because of this and Charles Hare's work, but after Charles Hare left and they filled the cove in, it created flat land upon which neighborhoods were built in the 1870s, late 1860s, early 1870s. And after we got through with this part of it, we found literally a neighborhood <coughs> that was still intact. It was like a wonderland. You see here the walls of houses that are still standing here. This is a house, it's house floors, and, and it, was, it was a neighborhood. You could walk down the walkways that were still in place, the wood platforms privies on either side, rain barrels still in, the, in, in place, house walls still up like that. It was kind of like Disneyland for an archaeologist. <clears throat> um, so that, that was, I've never seen anything like that. We often recover and find a rather um, foundation, you know, wood sills from where houses used to be, but I've never seen anything like that before, where you actually have the house walls still in place <clears throat> around the floors, rain barrels still in the yard. Yeah, another project, yeah, this is a, a 240 Pacific, another ship-related project. Uh, if you know where the Old Ship Saloon is on Pacific Street, if you've ever been there for lunch, it's called the Old, Ships, Old Ship Saloon because it's built immediately next door to where the ship called the Arkansas. It would, it sailed into San Francisco in 1849, was in trouble, crashed into Alcatraz, and dragged it back the next night, and then they pulled it up along what was then the Pacific Street Wharf, and it subsequently became um, a hotel, a restaurant, and then later 
a saloon, and then it later got taken apart by Charles Hare, but apparently he left a good part of it in place because it was found again in the 1890s and again in the early 1900s. And so there's a developer building on that same site right now, and we just recently did archaeology on it and found uh, more evidence of the Arkansas ship. We found a portion of its keel there. So parts of it are still there. So that's the Arkansas, and this is how it was repurposed. If you look carefully, it's not a very good picture. This is the Arkansas right here, mm -hmm. and that hotel is built right on top of it. See, see the bow right here? Um, so that was in 1854. They tore that hotel down and built another one on top of it, and then they dismantled what was left of the Arkansas and left it in place, and we found it. Uh, we do a lot of pipeline work. Kendra Morgan is one of our clients. Uh, we do work um, for them all over the Southwest and in Southern California. So as John was talking about, this is one of the components of that kind of a construction project. You need to go in and do the archaeology before anybody can disturb the ground, whether it's a pipeline or a developer or Caltrans or anybody else. And that's what we're doing here. We're in the alignment of the pipeline. Uh, there was an archaeological site here, a prehistoric site that we excavated, uh, did all the data recovery and covered a sufficient amount so they could continue and uh, building their pipeline. So that's about all I had to say. Um, that's what we do, and I'll turn this over. All right. cool. I may, may need to find a different chair. My yeah, twisting. Um, so I don't have any uh, slides to share. Uh, I thought I would just sort of talk to you directly about my experience coming out of grad school here at Berkeley, not too long ago, um, and just sort of what I encountered um, at that point when I saw some light at the end of the tunnel. I was looking at another tunnel. Um, so that's how it felt. Uh, anyway, so. What Adrian talked about, I was, I was one of those grad students who was thinking about you know, being a professor like that sounded great. Um, and what I studied wasn't exactly archaeology. It was hominid paleobiology, right? So I, um, and as an undergrad, I studied physical anthropology and geology. So that's like where I was coming from. I was like sort of a hard kind of earth sciences person. I was into dinosaurs. I was into hominids, that whole thing, right? Um, and the things that I were that I was interested in were osteology, human osteology especially, some lithics, but I wasn't really into that as much. I was more focused on like the biology of it and the geology of, of all this stuff. Um, and I spent a I spent a long time here, longer than <laughs> longer than I want to admit. Um, Ten years. Um, and I was, you know, not really not really thinking I was getting anywhere with that. And um, I, I was thinking to myself, you know, the, the numbers weren't great. Like, I, it was going to be really hard to get a job in academia and stay in academia. Um, and I literally had no idea what else there was, right? So I think this kind of forum is great. I wish I, wish I had had something like this. Um, and I kind of walked my way backwards into CRM. Right, into environmental consulting. Um, because I was just sort of sending out um, resumes at that point, right? It was, I was getting near the end of my program and I was like, what do I do? Um, and I landed at a small um, archeology span only company in um, Oakland. Um, and that was like my first foray, right? So I, I, had, I had archeology span that I learned in sort of the hominid fields in East Africa, like that was my like, um, attachment to archaeology, um, and so I sort of had to learn on the job. You know, um, I spent I spent some good some good years in San Francisco doing a lot of like the monitoring stuff. So I became more comfortable sort of understanding what does the 1906 burn layer look like. You know, what do, what do gold gold rush bottles look like? I had I had no basis for that, right? Um, so what some of these other folks have have told you, yeah, definitely, definitely get experience before you sort of leap into the deep end. Um, I think it would be helpful, it would have helped me, that's for sure. Um, and, but what I did discover is that part of CRM too is there's this little niche for paleontology. It's kind of this like forgotten little younger brother or whatever that just sort of comes along for the ride sometimes. Um, and 
think it's getting more to the point where it, where it can stand on its own for sure. Um, the company I work for, we do more than just archaeology. I think archaeology is actually one of the newer parts of Rincon, right? We're, we're bigger into water, um, greenhouse gas, the biology side of, side of environmental consulting in general, right? Um, but we do have an in-house archaeology slash paleo now program that employs 30 to 40 people. Yeah, and we're all, we're all over the state. I mean, I was lucky that, you know, we, we have an office in Oakland and I can like literally walk from home. You know, I don't have to commute, this is fantastic. Um, but if you're not from this area, maybe some of you are born and raised in California, you know there's offices in Ventura, uh, San Luis Obispo, Fresno, if you're from there, Sacramento, et cetera, right? So we, we do a lot of our work sort of down south in the Ventura, Carlsbad area. Um, and it's been, it's been great. I mean, I don't get to do as much sort of field work, I think, as um, I hoped I would. Uh, that was that was something that I learned from this. Um, like I got into paleontology in the beginning because I just wanted to be outside and like be in the dirt and like dig stuff up. You know? <laughs> I, mean, I, I think that's super fun. Um, but you know, definitely learn to write well because that's what you'll spend the bulk of your time doing. Like I write reports all day long, you know, um, just all day long. <laughs> Hygiene. <laughs> yeah. And I'm usually clean doing it. So. Um, but there are, you know, really, I think there are really good opportunities still to, you know, get outside. Um, and, I mean, we do a lot of projects like the high speed rail. You guys may have, may have heard about what's going on with that. I mean, that's a massive multi segment project that's probably going to continue for the next 20 years, who knows? Um, it's going on and on. Um, so that's, that's been interesting for me, like getting a chance to literally travel the state, either remotely via like Google Earth or my computer, or actually like driving down to you know, Los Angeles or, or uh, Lancaster or something, you know, some, some place I've like never been that's like way out there. Um, and yeah, so it's been it's been an experience, you know, definitely. And I'm 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 glad I sort of fell into this like the wrong way, in a way. Like I wasn't sort of planning on it. So it's been something that I've that's been constantly a learning experience, um, and something I didn't sort of map out, which makes it interesting. Like every day is totally different. Like I can't sort of predict what I'm even going to be doing tomorrow. Who knows, I may get some like frantic call like later this afternoon, like, hey Kyle, can you go to Fresno to like monitor something? It's like some emergency, you know? Like that happens too. So um, it keeps you on your toes and it's fun. But I would suggest like if there's some of you in this audience who are into rocks and like really old bones, um, there's a place for you too. Right. <laughs> so it's not all paleontology, you know. Dinosaurs in California they are few and far between, so <laughs> forget it. But uh, you may be on a job that you know finds mammoths, I and mean, that's like what everybody cares about. So twice to see megafauna. Right? Okay, that's it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think I'm actually going to move. Can I, can I yeah. uh -oh. That's not what you want to see. All right, well, well this thinks for a second. Uh, I'll introduce myself. So my name is Aidy Whitaker. Um, I work at a Far Western Anthropological Research Group in Davis, which is a mouthful. Um, we usually go by Far Western. Uh, but actually the name, the long name of the firm um, is kind of part of what I want to talk to you about, kind of how Far Western sees archaeology and CRM. Um, so Far Western started out, and, and uh, kind of like these guys are saying, they, they have lots of uh, Berkeley folks being in the Bay Area. Um, Far Western, we have a bunch of UC Davis grads. Um, so I went through UC Davis. Um, a bunch of us at Far Western are all UC Davis MAs and PhDs. Uh, 
But Far Western Anthropological Research Group actually started out in the late 70s as a bunch of grad students and these cultural resource laws had come on the books and people were trying to figure out how they were going to make, you know, how they were going to kind of set up this industry. And they started bidding on projects and they had no real way to do it. And they, they had offices, they were all grad students, had offices in the basement of the Anthro building on campus. And they started doing projects and it was kind of places they were working on their dissertation work and they would get a, a little side project. And, and there's actually stories about how they convinced the, uh, the uh, secretary in the office was typing up their reports for them on like university dime, um, but they were making money on these contracts. And finally somebody found out and kicked them off campus. Um, and it kind of evolved into a CRM firm, but that's been the basis, this kind of research orientation, people working where they want to work has been the basis of, of kind of Far Western's philosophy. And so uh, the way I thought I'd kind of introduce Far Western, and we have, uh, we have about 70 full-time archeologists. Uh, we have offices in Davis, um, Henderson, Nevada, which is basically Las Vegas, um, and Carson City. So we do a lot of great basin work as well. Um, but uh, it was to, to show you, oh, this is really small. So I, I'm actually, I hate reading slides, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this slide for you. So this is our statement of philosophy and it kind of gets to our priorities at Far Western. Um, and I'll, I'll just very briefly elaborate on those. So our, at Far Western, we seek to, cre uh, to creatively seek out ways to contribute to knowledge of California Great Basin prehistory and above and beyond the simple production of cultural resource management reports. Uh, to seek out and conduct those projects that have the highest potential to contribute to knowledge of California and Great Basin prehistory and history. But, and this is the important part here, kind of for a business perspective, is to recognize that not all projects can meet those requirements. And so sometimes we, you know, a lot of times we have to do projects that, uh, that aren't going to be of the highest research potential. But one of, one of the big takes that we have on CRM is that the reason we're protecting these resources is because they're important, it's our, it's our collective past, and it's important to let people know about it. So if we're gonna dig up archeological sites, we should learn something from them. We should make sure that, that we distribute our, our results widely. Um, and this is something we all do. I mean, all, all the people at the table here, right? Our goal is to get the information out to the public. And so, um, so that's kind of always my goal on a project, is what's my angle, like how, where, where is there some little data set um, I can pull in here? Or where can I synthesize some regional data? Um, and so that's been pretty cool for me. I've been at Far Western uh, about nine years now. And uh, I've gotten to work on some pretty cool things that I never thought I would get to work on. So uh, one of our goals is to kind of just move things along in pieces. And so I've had a few uh, journal articles that, that I've been able to produce that are based not just on maybe a single big project, but maybe we know that we're gonna have five or six projects all lined up in an area. Um, and so we start building data sets and, and little pieces of reports and we kind of recapitulate them and get to turn them into things. And so one, of the, one example is, and I, we were really hoping the Society for California Archaeology meetings are coming up next week, and we were really hoping we'd be able to distribute it to people, but we've been working on a, a research design for the Bay Area for prehistoric archaeology where we've synthesized lots of stuff that other people have done, stuff that we've done um, into this like 300 page research design. So it's really cool to get to kind of dive into the record. And um, I have a friend who worked at Far Western for a while, now he's a professor at uh, Sacramento State. And he liked to say that, that when you work in academia, you can work on whatever you want, but you don't have any money to do it. And when you work in CRM, a lot of times you have lots of money to do it, but you gotta go where the project is. So. Um, it's all about being creative and finding where we can um, find stuff. And so uh, along the lines of things that others have said, uh, this is actually just my personal map that I had prepared this for a junior college class I talked to. But, but these are all places I've gotten to do field work in California. And um, my dissertation field work was up in Humboldt County, way in the northern portion of the state. That was all I knew about archaeology was like the coast of California. Um, and because you have to jump in and learn stuff about all these other places, it's kind of forced me out of my comfort zone and you start seeing connections between everything. And so I think that's a really cool part of what we do. That's all I'm gonna say. Hi everyone. 
So I'm going to tag team with Rebecca, who's also here from our firm, and just give you kind of a, a brief overview of Environmental Science Associates, that's what the ESA is, and then Rebecca's going to talk about some of the interesting projects that we've been working on. <clears throat> so I'm Matt Russell, and um, I went through the program here a number of years ago. Uh, I'm the Archaeology Program Manager for our Bay Area Cultural Resources Group, and Rebecca is our Cultural Resources Technical Director. I work out of our San Francisco office, and Rebecca's in our Sacramento office. So a little bit about ESA. Um, we're a multidisciplinary environmental consulting and planning firm. We were founded in 1969, which gives us about 50 years of experience in all aspects of project planning, environmental assessment, natural resource management, as well as regulatory compliance. And as of now, we're more than 500 um, employee owners. Um, just to give you some perspective, I've been with the firm for about three years, and we were about 350 people back in uh, 2013. Now we're about 500 employee owners. It's a fully employee-owned firm, and we have technical experts in um, all environmental divisions. We've got seven dedicated practice groups. Cultural Resources is one of those practice groups. But we also have um, a water group, energy, community development, environmental hydrology, and uh, biology, and an airports group. So our company does all kinds of, of different projects. As one example, um, Strawberry Creek on the western ed edge of campus was restored a couple of years ago right by the Oxford Street entrance, and mm -hmm. our environmental hydrology group designed and implemented the restoration of Strawberry Creek. So we do that kind of work um, as well as archaeology. The cool thing about having so many different um, practice groups within our firm is that all the different projects they do um, outside of our, our cultural resources group generally have some kind of an archaeology hook. So we do a lot of our work for what we call our internal clients, which is project managers within the firm doing different kinds of projects um, you know, around the state and elsewhere. So we serve clients ranging from government agencies to nonprofit organizations to private industry. We're headquartered in San Francisco, but we've got offices throughout Northern and Southern California, Oregon, Washington, and Florida as well. We like to say we're large enough to offer a full range of services, but small enough to provide the kind of personal service and attention that clients expect from us. So um, I'll note too that we have a growing cultural resources group. In 2011, um, when Rebecca's firm joined ESA, there were just six archeologists firm-wide, company-wide, um, and two historians, and they're based just in California. As of right now, we've got um, seven archaeologists in Washington and Oregon, as well as two historians, and 22 archaeologists full-time in California, doing northern, northern and southern California, and um, 10 to 20 part-time, as well as 10 historians. So we've grown a lot in the last couple of years. Our cultural resources group provides the full range of cultural resources services that you would expect from archaeological surveys to historic <coughs> architectural services. And as I mentioned, we've got about 40 dedicated cultural resources staff, including archaeologists, architectural historians, historians, preservation planners, and monitors. And our in-house expertise um, kind of runs the gamut, prehistoric archaeology, maritime archaeology, like Jim, that's my background, and what I get excited about is maritime archaeology, um, geoarchaeology, historical archaeology, including specialties in um, Spanish and Mexican colonial archaeology, as well as overseas Chinese archaeology. Ethnography and coordination with, this, with um, descendant communities, architectural history, historical research, and landscape studies. So um, I manage a small group that's based here in the Bay Area. Like I said, I'm in the San Francisco <coughs> office. We've got an office in Oakland as well as um, several archaeologists on Petaluma office. And so we do a lot of work in the area. And uh, our San Francisco-based projects um, keep us very busy. We do a lot of work in the city. Um, and we have contracts or as needed um, contracts or, or um, different uh, relationships with lots of municipal organizations within San Francisco. So that gives us a lot of our work. And um, I'll say that we get involved through those agencies with a lot of very complex and interesting projects, many of which take a long time to go through the initial kind of regulatory process uh, I think John had a slide up showing the different phases of, of um, kind of cultural resources compliance, the identification phase, evaluation phase, and treatment phase. Well, the identification phase can take a long time working with these, these municipal agencies. Um, we write research designs, 
Um, we do a lot of background research to identify the types of resources that might be found during these projects. Um, we work with agencies to develop uh, environmental impact reports to satisfy CEQA, which is the California Environmental Quality Act requirements. We work with them to design mitigation measures that are going to mitigate impact to significant resources. And all that takes place um, long before we even go into the field. And, uh, and some of these big projects, we can, we can be in that phase for even a number of years. Uh, it's, actually, it's actually quite interesting because there's a lot of planning that goes into these projects before we even get out and put boots on the ground, as it were. Um, we work on a lot of different types of, of archaeological sites in San Francisco. That's why the city's so great, because it's such a wide variety of sites, including prehistoric, historical, and maritime. Um, we also work outside of San Francisco. The photo on the lower right is some recent work we did in Fremont at Mission San Jose. And with that, I'm going to let Rebecca um, say a few words. To the uh, Mission San Jose work, um, June Sanceri was out there doing some ground penetrating radar, um, which is one of the exciting things I, I guess I would like you to know is I. I don't want you to think of cultural resource management as an afterthought. I want you to think of it as a place to go where you can broaden your research, where you can really cut your chops on a lot of interesting things. Um, I know after I did my master's um, and working on my doctorate, I was a graduate TA like a, probably a lot of you were, and as I was thinking of thinking, becoming a professor, uh, my thought was, oh, hell no. Um, and <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> no. <laughs> but I do, um, I do want to follow, did want to follow my passion, which is really um, finding and connecting a lot of dots, which I think working in a lot larger firm is one of the things Matt and I really enjoy. Because we've been hearing a lot of the word archaeology here, but yet I see things from it's not just the archaeology, it's the architectural history, it's the historical research, it's the landscape studies, right? How has this land been used over time? And then I can turn to my colleagues who are biologists and environmental hydrologists and community developers and really start to tease apart and understand how did we get here? I mean, every campus I look at, I can I want to figure out the history, how it evolved over time, what were the natural forces that were making it so, what were the cultural forces that making it so, and that's how I try to approach um, the majority of the research that we do, um, is how do we live in this landscape? And, and in the age of Trump, I think that's how we're gonna make ourselves relevant. We have to ban with our environmental brethren. We're all in this together, right? Clean air is part of it, clean water is part of it, but how our cities, not only how they look today, but how they look tomorrow and what we're going to learn from the past that we're gonna bring along with us is really how I see what I do. So if I had um, any advice for you, I know I know that when you're going through these graduate programs, one of the things you end up doing is specializing. We got probably a lot of zooarchaeologists in the room. Maybe? Okay. Um, Prehistory. There's a lot of obsidian studies done. You, we tend to specialize and specialize, and that's so when we're going through these graduate programs, we can learn how to do one thing well. And I think having those kinds of specialties is really important. The other thing that's really important is learning how to speak to your colleagues so that you know what other um, kinds of research are going on and diversify yourself if you can so that you can at least have a handle on at least some of it. Um, myself, for example, um, I'm an historical archaeologist. That's If I'm going to put on my hats, that's the first one I pick up. I'm an historical archaeologist. To get there, I uh, went through the anthropology department and then the history department and then made my way into historical archaeologist. 
So I'm also an historian, and I'm also an architectural historian. And through all of those threads was working with the existing communities and learning how to talk with and for descendant communities. And so the ethnology, the, the reaching out to communities, to making archaeology and anthropology and architectural uh, history relevant really came through all of that. So as you're making your way in career, your career, yes, your sp specialties are important. But if you can't put on those hats comfortably, I would ask that you at least think about knowing enough about the other specialties that when someone wants an elevator speech from you about what are the architectural histories people do, you'll be ready to tell them. And that's really reflected in what we do here um, at ESA from the very beginning of just kind of background research to going out on the ground. Um, and I do spend um, a lot of time in the field um, and a lot of time uh, publishing the original research uh, that we do. And um, like John, I, I can't stress enough how important public outreach is. It's all of our jobs here to make archaeology, architectural history, biology, environmental hydrology, all of the ologies relevant or we will not be. The next slide. And now that I've, I've lectured at you, I'm going to tell you the fun part. Uh, this is about, uh, talking nerdy to you. Um, one of the things I, I, I think I, I've learned in my career as well is it's not just what I know, it's what other people know. And one of the things I think I'm really good at is um, identifying what other people's skills are and you don't have to do everything yourself. You want to know enough about it to be able to use it, but, but stretch your network. Um, get other people to work on your site. So at Mission San Jose, for example, um, working with June to come out and doing ground penetrating radar uh, was really helpful for us um, to identify where an Indian quarters, um, neophyte quarters were. And then I also was able to get Lee Panich from Santa Clara University um, who needed some research topics for him and his students and they're now working on those materials. And then Charlotte Sanceri will pick up some of the faunal materials. So it's a really nice synergy of, yes, there are legal requirements that we have to meet, but there's also our own research interests. And part of what I try to do is push the research as far as I can and keep the client engaged with that. And Mission San Luis Obispo was another really fun one there, that this is um, a city block about mm, two blocks away from the mission. And what we had there was where the Native Americans were living during the mission period. Um, a good water uh, ditch system um, from the aqueduct uh, that was associated with the mission. Um, there was a Chinatown there as well. There were... Um, privies associated with the brothels because, you know, why not? Um, and then also um, a 1940s trash pit that was put there by a Japanese-American family right before they were interned. So trying to tease out all the layers on this city block was really a challenge. So one of the people I worked with 20 some odd years ago Dominique um, Rosolo works at UC San Diego with the Jacobs Engineering um, School of Engineering. And he's put together what he calls the Cultural Heritage Engineering Institute. And that's where they put archeologists um, who often can't do math <laughs> and uh, structural engineers together. Uh, and it's, it's been just a brilliant synergy of the photogrammetry that they can do. Um, this one uh, we did, uh, the FAA regulations were, um, they couldn't fly a drone that day, so we got a minivan-sized uh, air balloon out there. 
and for the high view, and then we had the world's longest selfie stick out there. <laughs> and then we had um, his professional photographers, because they also brought from the UC system the media people who know how to take photos. Um, and they walked bent over at the, at the waist and took shot by shot of my site. And then they have the computing power, which UC um, facilities like this one often have, to put it all together. So that I ended up with a 3D model of my site, which effectively then my site became the artifact. And the architect involved with this was, was so interested and so excited in helping me figure out how, how the water conveyance system worked, but also what it related to in town. And so then to be able to turn around with him and we were able to preserve um, this wall in place. And it's, um, I don't think we'll be able to show it to people because it's, it's only a couple layers high. One good skateboarder could take it out. <laughs> um, so the better solution I think is to cover it. But then on the, the, with some redesign, the sidewalk that will now go through here we can put on the sidewalk what's underneath and do some interpretation. So this took, this took an architect, this took historians, this took archeologists, this took um, some media specialist people, this took some structural engineers, and it's that synergy, I think, that's going to be the best thing that we can do to continue to carry on what we label here as cultural resources management. That's all I got. Batter, it's low. You <laughs> <laughs> got 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. So my name is Scott Byram, and uh, I'll be talking about one of the technologies that Rebecca mentioned that Professor Jim Sinceri is, has been doing here at Cal and, uh, and several others are doing around the US and in other countries these days. It's ground penetrating radar. Um, and I'm not doing this in the context, I'm an independent consultant and I have been for, for some years and I was an independent consultant before I started doing ground penetrating radar. I did my uh, PhD at the University of Oregon and uh, had nothing to do with radar work. It was on uh, uh, wood stake fishing weirs and basketry and wet sites on the northwest coast and I did a few years of kayak surveys and recorded a number of sites up there. In the course of the years in the 90s and early 2000s when I was doing field work up in Oregon and sometimes in California and other places, I learned a lot about uh, archaeological landscapes and I worked on a lot of excavations in the desert and on the coast and other settings. And that uh, excavation experience really uh, stood me well when it came time to, uh, to specialize in ground penetrating radar, which is a departure from my career earlier. Uh, but I felt like it was a real necessity for archaeology to ex expand in this direction. A lot of my career I worked with uh, Native American tribes in Oregon as a consultant for the Coquille Indian tribe, for example. And the tribes that I worked with were really interested in the research, but they wanted to see a light footprint and in some cases even uh, no excavation at all. And this technique allows us to approach things from that direction. But we're taking it, um, uh, uh, June and I are in particular these days take, trying to take things in a new direction, get people to focus less on anomaly hunting and um, more look at the actual uh, data as representing the texture and form of archaeological deposits. And what you'll see in this presentation are these GPR transect profiles, which are basically a slice along a single transect. In this case, uh, eight meters or so, I believe. 
um, coming across uh, this uh, slice map, which is a horizontal plan map of the grid area that we worked on here over the faculty club lawn. Um, uh, so slice map, uh, uh, horizontal maps at a particular depth within the deposit, and then profiles that show uh, that transect and variation within the deposit, uh, in this case, down to about a meter or so. Uh, so we're looking uh, at uh, data in profile in this case, and as the instrument moves across the ground surface, the antenna moves from place to place uh, in line. There's an encoder wheel, a survey wheel that measures distance, and it allows us to map varied objects. In this case, an iron rod from a shipwreck on the Oregon coast that I located in 2012. Um, this is a point reflection. That's the chevron-shaped uh, image there on top of a uh, planar reflection, which is a transition in the sand dune where this was located. Um, it's a combination of planar reflections and point reflections of various size that characterize the, uh, or that define the, the blocks and tabula and lamina and uh, nodes and spheroids that make up the archaeological deposit. So um, there's a whole terminology about this that, uh, that I can steer you towards. And there's some great books by Larry Conyers with good examples of different types of features. But I just want to show a few examples of some of the projects that I've been working on in recent years. Like I said, I work as a consultant. It's a, it's a great career. I get to work for academic <coughs> projects or CRM projects. Um, I've gone as far away as France or Hawaii. I do a lot of work in California, especially the Bay Area these days. This is the Oregon coast, and an area where there was a reported shell mound underneath a, a, a lot of dredge deposits, uh, three meters of dredge spoils, which were also sand. And uh, just probing with an auger wasn't really adequate for identifying this, so we used uh, an excavator to open up a gravel road and, and uh, and ran a GPR profile through here. Or that's the instrument that we're using there, the antenna here. And I've got the computer up above, and that's the survey wheel. Um, and we were able to see down four meters into the dredge materials through the sand and see a buried soil that capped this uh, buried dune deposits all the way up to about where here, where it was truncated. And then there's an erosional slip face with a one-to-one -one, um, angle of repose. So that, the soil wasn't present on that side of the dune, but it was over here. And then we could really differentiate the dredge materials from the buried dunes. So when we, we were able to use this, this is a CRM project, which is well funded. I didn't have graduate students digging this trench. <laughs> this was actually a massive excavator. And we shored it up with metal and put in a couple of test units. And, and then our team was able to excavate down there. And they're excavating the, the jaw of a horse that's from a ranting era episode here. But we didn't find any shell in, in the dune, it's, uh, in this dune itself. So we were able to write that off as, as not a significant part of the site. Um, back in 2005, the first project I did was with Larry Conyers, also on the Oregon coast, and a uh, roading site uh, um, in a, in a uh, stabilized sand dune with a village site in the upper 1,000-year-old uh, component up here. This is called the Sariadin site near Port Orford. And the oldest house on the Oregon coast we were able to locate, too, this uh, layer here that's 5,000 years old. But you can see the, the GPR profile matched up with the, uh, the um, uh, erosional exposure in the dune up here. And you can see that the house floor shows up as this planar reflection. You see a lot of reflections that don't really match up to things. In some cases, it's just, it's just moisture. There are pockets of moisture that are showing up. We actually had a 7,000-year-old component underneath that doesn't show up very well in this profile. Um, but uh, we were able to take radiocarbon samples and collect lipids from that deposit. Uh, more commonly, I work on sites where there's architecture or other large features. Um, this is San Juan Batista, the uh, state park's land near the mission uh, down there near Hollister. And um, Glenn Ferris, back in 1991, had done some test units and synthesized some work from previous testing and reconstructed that this is where the Indian family housing was at, at the, uh, the mission. Um, so his black and white map is, is what we had to go on. And based on that, we set up some GPR grids. The first one we did was this one here, which matched up really nicely with Glenn's reconstruction of what the uh, room blocks were like. So this is actually stone foundation that I'm mapping in this case at the base of the, uh, um, uh, at the, base of the adobe. Um, down here, it was less clear. There was a property fence, so I wasn't able to get my oblique grid that I like to do when I'm mapping linear, linear features. Uh, but we still picked up 
pretty deeply buried uh, adobe walls in this case. And they're, they're more faint in this grid because there's a gravel road surface here. And so the gravel and the air pockets weren't as conducive to the TPR survey as the dirt over here. And we never did locate another building that Glenn supposed might be out in this direction. This is a close-up of that one grid that shows uh, one of the, where one of the transects ran through the slice map. So again, these, these grids are made up of multiple transects adjacent to each other, about half a meter apart, uh, and all the same length. Um, and this is what the profile looks like. So what was interesting about this one was we found some a type of feature that Glenn wasn't able to identify with his probing techniques before, which is these corridor posts from outside the dwelling. So, um, you can see one of them right here, a complex actually, probably the post itself and then a uh, supporting structure outside of it. Um, a buried surface which may have been contemporary with when the structures were standing prior to the adobe melt. Um, it would have filled the area here. And then the adobe rubble and bricks, in this case, right here. Uh, last summer I was out in uh, uh, Fresno, and this is a little bit hard to see a little dark, but these are tunnels at the Fresno, or the uh, Forestier Underground Gardens, and uh, we were, this is for a high-speed high speed rail offset project where um, there was going to be a development adjacent to the gardens, and uh, we were looking for buried tunnels, and because of the, the salt in the deposit, I was only get, able to get down to about a meter and a half to two meters with the, the low-frequency antenna that I used, a really big 200 megahertz antenna. Um, but it was enough to see the top of some of the tunnels, as you can see in this case here. So we're able to trace some of those out, and they'll be able to set those aside or decide what to do um, as they continue with construction in that spot. Uh, working with Tim Gill, who is a, a Berkeley grad with a PhD here, uh, who is an ARC affiliate, I believe, um, on his property out in, in Hawaii, um, we've been able to document also Pat Kirch as part of this project. We were able to document uh, the interior of uh, a structure that's not a heiau per se. It's an enclosure or a pa, but you can see the circular structure here. Um, there's actually a buried wall over here. I think most of the rock that's over here is um, just part of the basalt lava flow. That's my interpretation so far, but they're hopefully gonna go, does anybody know if they've got the National Geographic funding to go this summer? Uh, sooner or later, they'll be back out there doing a little bit of testing um, at this location, but it's largely a site that's going to be preserved. So it's great to have the detailed information about the site without actually having to do the uh, to do extensive excavations. Shell mounds are one of the types of sites that I've, I've gotten great data from. Um, you can see this buried shell mound transect profile. This is the direction of the profile from here to here. And uh, you can see the eroding shell in the path there. That's not sand, that's all shell. Um, but if you were to dig into that shell, I don't know what technique you'd have to excavate with, uh, with a blower or something in order to get this kind of detail. Typically we see more detail in a GPR profile of a shell mound than you actually see when you're doing the excavation. You can see these fine layers. And you can see that they're relatively almost horizontal over here in the outside of the midden, but then as you get inside they get a little bit more steep they bank inward, and then there seems to be a disturbance in excavation here, which may have been one of the uh, Native American longhouses that were built in this part of the mm -hmm. Oregon coast, or it could have been uh, a later structure that predated the parking that was put in here. One of the larger projects where we did a really detailed uh, GPR sequence was the Stege Mounds over here with uh, Alta Archaeological Consulting, and again, we were able to identify more layers in the GPR profile than the geoarchaeologists could see after the excavation had taken place because the blade of the shovel or trowel smears together these microstrata. Um, so it's a technique that anytime anyone's going to excavate a shell mount, I would say if you've got a smooth surface on top to do detailed GPR work ahead of time, just a couple days of GPR prior to an excavation like this gives you a lot of great information. You can see different uh, burn lenses, the, uh, an intrusive pit showing up over here, lots of different features. Doing okay on time? <laughs> Not really. Um, uh, so I've gone around to some of the truncated shell middens in the Bay Area that have uh, asphalt on top, and they're in great shape. These are just my notes on some of the profiles. 
at um, Alameda and San Mateo, but the buried shell mounds are out there. They're just, they've got houses on them and streets paved across them. Um, the project they did a couple years ago at San Diego Old Town, um, to where they're gonna reconstruct one of the adobe dwellings as part of the historic park. Um, I was able to locate the adobe that they were looking for here. And also this other feature that state parks had excavated a couple years ago um, looks like this in profile. These are kind of uh, coarse images because I had to use a large antenna, low frequency to get down to the right depth for this. Uh, just another example of a, a bottle dump, a typical historic site. Uh, lots of spiky little pro, uh, point reflections here that are metal and bottle glass. And then the buried stratum here. This is a filled bottle dump that's been capped by Phil up at the Government Hill on the Celeste Reservation. And then um, uh, pits are one of the things that we often find in these transect profiles. This is where the Russians put their first flagpole at Fort Ross on the Pacific Coast here, Sonoma County Coast. And Glenn Ferris, uh, uh, who many of you know, uh, state parks archaeologist for his entire career, had um, plotted this location during the field work and we went out and put a small grid right in the middle of the stockade. Actually, it wasn't right in the center, it was offset. But he thought he had the location based on historic records, and sure enough, the pit was right where he expected. We also traced a road that uh, Breck Parkman had seen evidence for in a trench. This is probably from the Russian Pomo village that was here during the 1820s. Um, just another example of some of the innovative approaches. Uh, we're, uh, with Nico's help, we're able, I was able to do some comparisons between magnetometry and GPR at the same location, set of grids. 20, each of these squares is 20 by 20 meters. And we identified a number of different features at this homestead site from the 1860s. And just an example of one of those features, we think it's the actual cabin itself. And you wouldn't, based on just that, um, just that data, you wouldn't say, well, we've got a cabin right here. But um, if you go into the actual individual transect profiles, you can see a pretty clear concentration of small nodes or point reflections in what we call an occupation surface at about 30 centimeters, 40 centimeters depth in this profile. And that's the case for adjacent profiles as well. And it turns out that this is where the, the actual historic cabin was. The foundation's not there because it was probably a wooden superstructure foundation. Okay. Um, if you want to read more about some of the techniques that I'm talking about here and, and getting past the anomaly hunting focus, um, there's a link that you can't really read very well here, but this is online now. It's available. It uh, just came out in the Journal of Archaeological Method and Theory. Um, I know we're way over on time, so I'm going to close it there. Thank you. So, uh, thanks everyone. Very interesting presentation. Um, so, we wanted to open it up first for uh, maybe some, if, if you have questions for one another or comments on each other's presentations, we can spend a few minutes for some back and forth that way, and then we can open it up to the questions. Uh, so, yeah. Well, whatever. And, all right, well, I'll, I'll, I was listening to uh, John. I, was, I, I really was listening to him. And uh, he was talking about um, uh, what's going to happen due to the political changes that have happened uh, recently. And uh, John mentioned it, somebody else mentioned it, I can't remember quite, quite um, hang on. Um, about how former administrations had attempted to go after cultural resources, legislation, perhaps was Rebecca, um, in the past. And for those of you who remember the Reagan administration, is anybody that old here? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, you young yeah, things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, if you recall, so Reagan was um, uh, present with a with actually a pretty strong national mandate. He also uh, had a Congress that was a Republican Congress, a Republican dominated Congress. So, the, the closest analogy I think we have to what we what we're dealing with now is probably the Reagan administration to some degree. Um, and uh, as I think John said, um, the, his strategy was twofold. It was a, an attempt initially to repeal the legislation because the regulations are developed from 
the legislation, right? So you repeal the legislation, you get rid of the regulation. He was unsuccessful in that, that wasn't gonna work. So what he did was, as John said, uh, two-fold approach. Um, he reduced the funding to certain agencies, first of all, and uh, thus you reduced their ability to enforce their own regulations. And I think that's probably what we're looking at here. Like uh, somebody else, some other folks had mentioned um, um, uh, EPA, which is something that's most definitely undergone, right? Uh, we've also done uh, work with uh, EPA, and they're looking at a, what is that, 25% funding reduction? I mean, that is slaughter. That is absolute slaughter. So you can only imagine that they're, if they can no longer clean up lead that children are ingesting every day, right? Where is archaeology in that priority? Well, my thought is, like, nowhere. I mean, I know what I think is more important. I don't think, people, I don't think children should be eating lead. And archaeology can go to hell, right? Basically. So I think that's, that is probably what we're looking at. So that's the first point. The second point is, um, historically, if you look at what, um, uh, frankly, and I try not to make this too political, but I have to. Uh, if you look at what Republican <laughs> Congresses do, um, basically, pretty much every year, there is an attempt to um, uh, change uh, the existing um, uh, law. Uh, the Antiquities Act, 1906 Act, 6 Act, is frequently, pretty much every year is attacked. That gives the president the ability by uh, the executive order to create national historic landmarks. And Obama did that quite a bit. So essentially, it's not creating something new. Basically, you can take federal land and you can give it additional um, uh, protection. Well, many in, uh, extractive industries do not like that. So pretty much every year there's an attack on that. And one of the people who has been defending that um, has been a very, uh, uh, has been a very much a, um, uh, on the current president's radar as a bad guy. Um, and so I wonder, uh, even though he's a Republican, um, I wonder if that is gonna give way, I'm talking about John McCain, by the way. Uh, I'm wondering if that's going to give way. Uh, McCain has always been a very strong supporter of uh, Native American uh, issues. Right? That's one of the reasons why he didn't get a say in Congress, because of John McCain. I mean, he's, he can see somebody who historically could work on both side of the, sides of the aisle, because that used to be a, a good thing, you know? Evidently not anymore. Oh, politics, of course. <laughs> with his, you know, he's still an important guy, but uh, one wonders about uh, you know, his, relate, his personal relationship with the president since it's so bad. Uh, that is not a good thing for cultural resources. Anyway, so now I'll try. I think following up on Adrian on that, one of the, and it's something I was alluding to, that one of the best things we can do is organize not only with ourselves, and you'll see the Society for American Archaeology, the Society for Historical Archaeology, the American um, Cultural Resources Association, all next week are having uh, Preservation Advocacy Week in Washington. Um, I'll be heading out there on Monday. Um, we've hired um, our lobbyists. We now have to have lobbyists with the preservation groups, right? Um, and learning how to, to to talk about why history is important um, and what we lose when we don't have that background. But Adrian is right, it's going to come down to, to some difficult choices and it's going to take organization and that's why working with, the bi with biologists, working with other scientists, working with other hydrologists is, is never been so critical because we are all in this together. Um, and I think we're going to see over the next few years um, how we're going to sink or swim. 
one of the best resources I've seen of how to be in this together uh, is on this campus, George Lakoff. He's a linguist. If, if you haven't seen his book, for God's sake, get them. Because one of the things he's talking about, and, and, and Adrian's right, it, it is political, is how to talk Republicans. Right? That we need to reframe some of our arguments and some of the ways we present things so that um, it's not just preservation of the past, it's our moral obligation to save our independent history for our children. So it, it's that reframing and learning to use key phrases and words and language is so important. As anthropologists, if we didn't learn that, we're all in trouble. Um, but I, I think it's, it's going to be a huge challenge. <coughs> we need to practice amongst ourselves of how con to convince ourselves of why we're important before we can move that forward um, and, and start to talk to them out of like this. So I have until Monday to <laughs> Let, let me spin off that a little bit. And actually, Jim, I'm curious if, because you guys have Texas operations, so Far Western is in California, but we also are in Nevada. And so, you know, if you get, take, take away the federal laws, then we're dealing with two very different situations, right? So, so Nevada's kind of a purple state, but right now, Republican senators. And, uh, and so our principal is in charge of our Carson City office has decided that, that our best approach in lobbying, so the nice thing about Nevada is, whereas it's a lot harder for us to get at our, if we wanted to get at our senators, it's gonna be hard for us to get an appointment with, with Feinstein or, or Harris, right? But there's a lot fewer people in Las Vegas. So, so Craig Young is our, our principal uh, in charge of the Carson City office with a couple other owners of CRM firms in the Reno area, was able to get a meeting with a senior staffer for Senator Heller, who's the newly elected Republican senator. And the argument they made to, to this staffer was an economic one. That, I mean, so, you know, we all listed how many employees we have. Uh, so he, he went in and said, I employ 70 people with work in the state of Nevada, and at times I employ 200 people. And when the Ruby Pipeline was being built across the, the, the whole width of Nevada, we were employing 500 people. And so I think as Rebecca's saying, the, the, you know, if we can't make a, an appeal to kind of why we're in this discipline, there is, I mean, we're, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars industry. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, and that's the language they maybe will speak. And as with the National Historic Landmarks are popular for a reason, they're one of the most popular tourist destinations we have. Tourism is one of the biggest drivers of our economy. Um, it's, it's that, those kinds of hooks that we have to be more creative to think about. It's not just what we value, it's what the people we're talking to value. Yeah, going back to language, I'm learning Russian. And, uh, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> but I also think what's really important is like with McCain, to some extent Feinstein, and some people that, that have supported historic preservation, that a lot of it's at the local level. Mm -hmm. So a bridge in Texas may not have the same feeling and associations that are bridging Gurneyville. And I use Gurneyville for example because it was another example of how a local community loved their bridge and the bridge was saved. So the Native American uh, game has really influenced uh, historic preservation laws. Uh, California has some of the strictest laws for consultation, um, in bringing in indigenous communities, uh, and a lot of it's been because of the gaming lobby, uh, giving money to politicians. Uh, Hawaii is another one where, uh, before you go out and do any project, you consult with the Puna or elders. Uh, and, you know, the community is, is really involved in, uh, you know, what goes on, whether, I've worked on a couple wind farms over there, and, uh, you know, so, I have found out, and even with some of our fiber optics work, 
you know, the difference between historic preservation stuff that went on in Menlo Park, Palo Alto, and Stanford, uh, compared to Gilroy. Uh, it was incredible. It's like night and day. So my opinion is it's very much a local thing. Uh, and California is positioned well because our laws, whether they're the environmental laws, are a lot stronger than the federal nexus. <coughs> um, and we have Governor Brown uh, that hopefully will fight for California. <laughs> Maybe. Don't forget your state Trying to get more and more of the 
uh, residual effects of our projects out to the public in the form of public displays and the buildings that are being built. Yeah. And every single time that happens, it's astounding how many people come out. 